Welcome everyone. I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, where we have a mission to change the world one brave word at a time around here. And here today to help me with that mission are some of the amazing authors of a new book we have coming out, Sacred Spaces, Subtle Shifts for Mind, Body, and Home Transformation. And before I introduce you to these lovely ladies, I want to say a huge thank you to Colleen Avis, Without you, Colleen, we would not be here. Colleen had a really big mission for this book, you guys, and she brought together a stellar author cast. And I'm so excited to introduce you to two of the amazing authors today. Welcome, Allison and Lisa. Thanks for being here. Thank you, yeah, Laura. So Allison Qualter is a mother of three kids, a founder of three businesses, an adventure traveler, and a certified life coach who helps clients get unstuck and find more meaning through the power of play. And Lisa Wilson is the CEO of the Raw Food Institute and is a blue diamond leader at doTERRA. She loves exploring the art of natural plant therapies. So we're going to start this little party off today by talking to Allison. Tell us about this amazing chapter that you wrote. Thank you, Laura. First, I want to thank you for this incredible company that brings so many authors together and also thank Colleen who, um, for this opportunity. It's, it's really an incredible group of people that have come together with a similar mission. My chapter is chapter 18 in the book, and it's called Play. And the subtitle gives it away, which is, I think it's the missing ingredient in our self-care as people. Um, my story is essentially based in a time in my life when I was just turning 40, I had three kids and um, a couple of businesses I had started and I felt sort of this happy success on the outside. But on the inside, I was carrying chronic stress. I had broken my ankle. I had Epstein-Barr. I had three ulcers. I was under a tremendous amount of like sort of stress, but also longing for something that was missing in my life. And I felt almost guilty for wanting more than I already had. And I took a sort of, I pressed the pause button on my life and I took a week off of my parenting responsibilities and my responsibilities at work running my company. And I went on a 15 yoga class in five days challenge in New York City. And it felt gluttonous and frivolous and, and everything, you know, that I felt guilty who was gonna feed my son his first avocado and my kids would, would they be getting dressed in the morning and how would anything happen with me without work because it's so important and all these things, but I did it anyway. And I remember the first day sort of feeling stiff and, and sort of the worry and the stress of it. But by the end, it was really a revelation that I could sink into my soul and nothing would be lost and that I could get back in touch with myself without compromising all the things around me. And it was my kids actually that gave me what I call my light bulb moment when I walked in the door that Friday night after the 15th and last class. And I walked in the door and my twin girls who were then seven years old ran up to me and said, you know, mommy, when are you gonna do this week again? You've been so happy. Can you do it? Can you do more of this? And I had this really a light bulb moment that what your kids want and what your colleagues want and what the people around you want is for you to be happy. And so sacrificing all of the things in our lives um, for, you know, sort of some expectation we're trying to meet or the milestones we're trying to reach were really for what if you're not happy in your soul. And so that's what my chapter is about. I give some tips and tools at the end to help other people get there as well. But play is, is, is really the, the way that I found myself again. I feel like the pl play in general is such an in interesting journey where we're kind of born for it and then some of us lose it along the way and we have to find it again. And I wonder when and how we lose that. Well, talk a little bit more about that. It's a great, a great thought. Um, it's interesting. I play I worked for 20 years, I worked in play. So I worked at the United Nations on sport and play programs in countries all over the world. I was mostly focused in West Africa, but I've been into the most remote pockets of the world and saw how play is more than just a frivolous thing for children. It's actually a coping mechanism in a lot of situations of conflict and poverty and war. And then I worked in a playground. I built a playground 15 years ago called Apple Seeds, which was a pioneer in the industry. And we ended up franchising to 33 locations across the country. And 
were focused on the newborn to five-year-old child. So I wrote a lot of curriculum on learning through play, which is a pedagogy based from Italy that really focuses on how kids learn through this idea of play. And then I started coaching adults about three years ago. And I noticed after coaching adults that after all these years working in play programs and in the area of play, that that is the first thing that is lost. It's somewhere along the way, and I don't know where it is, and I think it's different for every person. We forget that we are allowed to play, that we get take our life pretty seriously, and we take our jobs pretty seriously, and we forget that a portion of our life is the need to have fun and enjoyment and play. Now, fun is an outcome, play is how you get there, right? So I focus on the action steps you can do. I came up with five play personas or personalities that I found after years of kind of working with people on play that we all fall into one of these five. And we're all a little bit of all of them, but they're the mover, the thinker, the creator, the connector, and the explorer. And usually again, all of those speak to us, but one is a predominant way we like to find joy and tap the present moment. And play, the way I define it, is when you're losing track of time, it's when you're in flow, you're touching the present moment, you're not worried about what other people think of you, and you're, you're truly, truly in a state of joy. And so whatever that is for you, maybe it's gardening, maybe it's, for me, it's definitely not cooking, I'll tell you that, but for some people it is. Um, it might be hiking, it might be getting on a plane and going somewhere to a new place, it might be doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. You know, it, it fits into one of those five, five personas. And so my, um, my goal in my business is to really help people refine who they are, but then within that, you know, what it is they can do more of to add more balance to their life, to add more joy to their days, to add more meaning, because, you know, we get exactly one go around on this planet and to just keep going towards this adult seriousness that we have for our jobs and our roles and our expectations and our parenting duties and all the things and, and lose sight of the fact that we're allowed to play is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost urgent to help people get there for, um, to find more joy and meaning. This feels like a deep dive topic. And I know that we could talk about this one all day long. I have thoughts about when we were told we weren't allowed to anymore. And mm -hmm. when we were told it was inappropriate and in, you know, environments, situ situations and that, and how we carry that baggage to adulthood. So let's put a bookmark there for a minute. I'm going to ask you more about that in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Lisa, I want to hear about your amazing chapter. Thank you. Um, and I'm loving the conversation. So thank you. Thank you for, for all of you, Colleen, and, and for you, Laura and Allison. I, I'm playing right now. I'm actually touring. I'm, 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 with friends in North Carolina, I live in Connecticut. I'm on a big tour and I hear we, I'm going solo camping. I haven't camped in like two decades. And a couple days ago, I wrote to my daughter and I said, I'm having mommy guilt. I literally almost turned around and went home. She's 17. I have two boys in college. She's 17. And she said, no mommy guilt, no mommy guilt, have fun, enjoy. So I love it. So yeah, good still for her. That. Play and mommy guilt, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but having fun. So thank you. Yeah, my chapter um, is is about essential oils. It's called Ancient Plant Wisdom. And as I've been raising my kids through the years, I was always that mom that was looking and seeking and searching for natural solutions you know, uh, conventional medicine has absolutely a place, but if I can address it naturally first, I will. So I became a health coach when my kids were little, two, four, and six, and I was doing health coaching. Um, when I become a speaker, spoke, you know, in some of the biggest stages around the, the country, um, you know, Pure Living Expos, Annie Appleseed, Raw Living Expos, and just got really into plant medicine. Just anything, like I just gobbled it up. You know, some people might read a novel at night, I read medical literature, I read natural, natural therapy. So I just, I just love it. And so in, in 2008, I started running retreats, right? I started calling it the raw food Institute, but it's so much more we do. We do infrared and, and frequency therapies. And I, I started asking a doctor to come in and teach essential oils. I realized that it had to be part of our curriculum. So you did mention I'm in doTERRA. Um, at, the, at the beginning, I just wanted the education, right? I just, it, it, that business, like, 
fell into my lap, sort of. I just knew that I had to teach natural concentrated plant medicine. It was so safe and it was so effective. So I've been teaching, you know, how to create your own home apothecary, how to, every time one of my kids would scrape their knee, um, we addressed it naturally. And, and I'm, I can't even imagine life without essential oils at this point. And I started doing this thing called symphony of the cells where there's different protocols. There's infectious disease protocols. There's, you know, anti-inflammatory protocols. There's cold and flu. And it's, it's a protocol where you're literally dripping them down your spine because the spine has access to your brain and central nervous system. And after months of doing this every single night, some of the sacred oils, creating blessings around it, um, I, I'd also in that same year dedicated a year to the spirit. And I was, you know, I grew up Catholic and I was on this mission to just like feel like, like, like feel something profound, like have a profound experiences. And so I had committed at one point, I did, I did many things like in that journey, but one of them was going to Costa Rica and doing ayahuasca, some ayahuasca ceremonies with a shaman and, um, and I'd been studying, I've been looking at the documentaries and, and a friend of mine who, you know, was also my retreat manager, she came over to my house and I said, I did it, I, I booked it. And she was like, oh my gosh. And she said, are you scared? And actually I, I asked my husband to go with me. This was his conversation. I said, you know, would you like to go? He, and I fully expected him to say no, cause he was just not interested. And he said, um, yes. I said, did you look at it? Cause it's not yoga on the beach. And he said, he, he said, yeah. And, and I said, are you scared? And he said, terrified. So, you know, I did a lot of things scared that year. Um, and when, you know, I had a moment that I write about in the book where I spun around in my kitchen. I said, I don't know, I'm changing so fast. I, I can't keep up with me. And I said to Joelle and I spun around and I said, Oh my gosh, Joelle, it's the oils. When you start putting this pure plant wisdom on and in your body, it's going to change you on a cellular level. And so while I love talking to people about the apothecary and how to, you know, how to use it as medicine, you know, when somebody has the sniffles, when somebody goes down, you scrape a knee, you know, aches, pains, rheumatoid arthritis, like I love that. I geek out on the medical. The spiritual piece snuck up on me and I didn't even know what that it had happened so that was how the chapter was born <laughs> I'm sitting here and you can't see it of course because it's beyond my computer but I've got my doTERRA diffuser and my oils over there and depending on what I need and the you know I've got the selection and I also really love it and this is absolutely a perfect segue into this next question. So I'm going to stick with you, Lisa, to answer it. And then Allison, I'm coming to you too with it. Um, you know, as a, as a health and wellness practitioner myself, um, with a decades long journey there, in, from the very beginning, I knew that a holistic approach was important. And what I want to know from both of you today, so you first, Lisa, why is it so important that we do this holistically? What about that word holistic? What does it mean to you? Well, let me share another moment I had. It was a wake up mommy moment for me. I was at the Institute for Integrated Nutrition in 2006, and I had been traveling to every doctor I could to figure out what was wrong with my kids. They were two, four, and six, and one of them had that early stages of autism. He was checked out, and the other one had facial tics, and I've been having him tested for Lyme disease, you know, and you're going, I know they're smart, but where is he, and, and what's wrong with my kids, and I was on this mission to figure this out, and I changed their diet dramatically. We're eating fermented foods. I'm making my own kombucha. I mean, we're drinking mushrooms, you know, I mean, Rishi Chaga, she, you know, like, like <laughs> we're that house. And I had a conversation with, and, and I don't want to get into this really deeply, but I'll, I'll drop it um, with, with a doctor that was also in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And he asked me to take a look at the side effects of vaccinations. And so again, I'm not going deep into that topic because it's a hot topic right now. 
But for me, what I had realized is I did have two vaccine injured children. And, and I've spent the last 18 years completely reversing it. And, and that means with food and clearing them and cleansing them and really understanding that there are side effects in medicine and not that it doesn't have a place. And if I broke my leg, we're going to the hospital. And, you know, I appreciate modern medicine, but there are side effects. And, you know, another a medication comes with 10 side effects. And we don't know when you have a medication and a medication, what how they overlap lap, and what the consequences are of that. Whereas plants, when you bring green juice and you bring, uh, you know, kimchi and you bring um, essential oils in, they actually enhance the effects of the neck. So plants have this incredibly beautiful synergy that works together within the body. So, and they work, uh, you know, and before I found oils, I had other solutions that worked. We would, you know, reach for salt gargles. We would, you know, lemon in the morning. I mean, there are so many things that work that um, I will I will reach for them because of the side effects, because of the consequences. So anytime I can, we will reach for the, the natural solution. Thank you for that. That's one of the most important reasons um, I think of uh, holistic as being important. Allison, what do you wanna to add to that? Um, when you think of this holistic approach, why is that important? And remember to unmute girl. <laughs> I was muting before for Lisa. I just wanted to comment on Lisa's story because I it really spoke to me. I'm like, this is why I'm so grateful to be a part of this book, to be with such sort of intelligent and thoughtful people. Um, and we have to talk about Costa Rica later because I've been going for the last 10 years and probably we're in the same beach. But um, I, I think for me, the word holistic, you know, there are people, authors in this book, but people in this world who focus on what I would consider self-care and the definition that I use from the book, my clients. So that's adding meditation and mindfulness into your day, proper nutrition, healthy nutrition. And, and Lisa touched on a lot of that. Um, regular exercise, I'm a big athlete sort of mover and sleep. And if you don't sleep, by the way, nothing else happens in the rest. So those are the four things. And what I started to notice is that I want to add play to that. And the reason why I put, put that in a holistic perspective is the word work life, the words work life balance have always been something, maybe an overused term. And I said, when I started coaching, I started using the word work life blend because I was able to bring my kids to work with me and I was able to blend my work in my life. But that's not always possible. And it actually is a balance. And so I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the handstand because I'm a giant handstander. I do handstands on six continents. I know I have a coffee table book in the making of a a book of handstands. I love handstands. I encourage little kids to do handstands. I encourage <laughs> an 80 old woman to do a handstand. I do handstand workshops. I love handstands. And the metaphor of the handstand is what I mean by holistic, which is, you know, adding playfulness to your life, flipping your perspective, turning it upside down. The balance of the handstand in the work-life balance is really saying, I know a lot about work and I spend a lot of time over here, whether I'm a stay-at-home mom or in my office or in a corporate job, but I'm not, what's really my life side of the equation? Do I even know what it means? Do I even, can I even define what makes me tick in my life? And the reason why the balance is so elusive for people is because one side's out of balance. And so for me, holistic is looking at not just meditation, nutrition, exercise, and sleep, but also this work-life experience we live in, whether, you know, again, your work is in or out of the home and saying, am I balanced enough? And again, you're never going to strike it perfectly. One day you're going to wake up and you're going to be more about work. One day you're going to wake up and you're going to have the best life day and you're going to forget about it. It's okay in the, in the macro as long as it washes out, a holistic life for me is adding, building up that life side of your equation so that you feel more in balance. And to me, the way to do that is to find the ways you play and allow yourself to do more of it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I, I love thinking about this and talking about it in all of the different ways. Let me just say a quick thank you to you both. And thank you to all the authors who came into this project with your very unique voices and the ways that you talk about all of these topics. Thank you for sharing the vulnerable stories that you did, but you you both are master teachers as well. And so in this book, I want our listeners to know you're going to have master teachings and tips and tricks and things you can actually try 
and you did this brilliantly. It's one thing to be able to coach your clients. You guys do this every day, but to write it in words in a book in a way that the reader gets an experience is a skill. And you did it really, really well. And I can't wait for everyone to read about these things that they can try. Essentially, you're all giving gifts of awareness. And I think that awareness is everything. I think it's the key to understanding healing and transformation. And I really feel lucky to have had a life dedicated to awareness, but I want to help people who maybe haven't so they can benefit too. Um, so Allison, you first share a little bit about what your practice looks like uh, practically in the day to day. What are you doing when you're practicing these different things? Give us a couple ideas. For playing, you're talking about specifically to playing? Well, yeah, I know you're going to answer with play as one of them, but <laughs> any form of your awareness practice. You know, one example for me is when I am in the state in the morning where I'm just coming back into my body and realizing I'm waking up. Before I even throw the covers off to run to the bathroom, <laughs> I take a moment and I'm in purposeful gratitude. So that's one of my awareness practices. I try to get to that as soon as I can when my eyes are open and I'm waking up. And that's just one little tiny piece of how I practice. How else do you practice? Um, it's a great question. It's actually a really deep question. And I, I'll answer in two different ways other than practicing mindfulness meditation, which I've a few years ago instituted every day and sort of now can't live without because it's really a grounding moment for me every morning. Um, maybe the less obvious things I do are um, come back to the word, um, the words perspective and appreciation. And, and I'll give you an example in parenting and I'll give you an example of, of what I use with my clients, but it's a part of my life. I often visit my older self. I think every day I do. And so I think this is a really powerful way to take the long view, get out of the small stuff to release a little bit of tension and stress in a moment. Because when you sit and visit your older self on a park bench or in a forest somewhere, um, and have a conversation, the, the, the spin that you're in may not really matter. And so that to me is one of the most powerful tools I use to kind of come into conscious awareness and realize in this moment, the investment of energy I'm putting into this conversation, this person, this particular situation at work, this, you know, this ailment, whatever it is, does it matter later? Um, usually the answer is not so much. So that's helpful. And then in parenting, um, I have three kids and uh, now my twins are teenagers and my son is a tween. And so, you know, and I've worked with toddlers and, and babies for years. So I have a, a strong sense of um, parenting having worked in that space for 20 years. And um, I will say that in the moment of the conversation that's going in the direction you don't necessarily want it to go, um, again, perspective on their view, I will often almost out of body, much like I go to my older self, out of body, go into the person, one of my children, as I'm talking to them and try to kind of put on their lens. Um, because meeting a kid where they are is really what it's about. And I always say, you know, your kids are not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. And so this is really something that if you can kind of embody and embrace the lens of your child, the perspective they have, the, the things that they're going through that you've never been through, the fact that you've been 16 before, but they've never been 49 and that, you know, you know, you know, certain things. So I think that is a very helpful um, perspective giving experience for parents that it can, can come in handy in terms of coming into awareness. I love it. Oh my gosh, this is why I say that these are gifts. And of course, we need all of the ways to hear this. We need all of the ideas. There's so many different people in the world and they do need to hear it in exactly the way, you know, Allison just said it. You got you guys know how this is, right? Someone could tell you this tip nine times and then the 10th person, the different person says the exact same thing, but in exactly the way you needed to hear it. And all of a sudden the light bulb goes off. Um, <laughs> that's why I love hearing you all talk about this stuff. Um, Lisa, how about you? What does your practice look like on the day to day? 
No, you're asking the question and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and, and, and what's coming up for me right now is, is, is relevant, being relevant. What I mean by that is like, I think it feels like the whole world is in fear, right? And I have a good friend who's doing a lot of what you're doing, Laura, bringing conscious people together, having Zooms, and she's been very successful in her business. And she had this uh, potluck in her house. And I stopped in. I didn't even know what it was. I just got an invitation. But I, I really want to tell her, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the work you're doing in the world. And I sat at this potluck. And admittedly, I've been in, in that place, that fear place. What's next? You know, where, where are we going to live? The reason I'm on this tour right now is checking out conscious communities. What are people doing? How are they coming together? Um, you know, how can people grow together, grow food, literally like growing food together? <laughs> um, you know, what does it look like to be in a conscious community? How do you form a conscious community? So we're just heading out the door and we're going to, the, to tour some conscious communities today. And um, I, I was sitting with her and she, she was doing this. She was creating and she was saying, you know, isn't it amazing right now? Here we are in the world and we literally get to create like we are all meant to be here right now. And she put, totally put me in a different space. And this was probably over a year ago. So since then, I've been in this other space of what can, instead of being, you know, in fear, going with it, you know, withdrawing, how can we get out right now and create, like really be creative and creating the future and the life that we want? What can we do differently that we're not aware of? And we're talking about land trusts and different ways to put your businesses and um, who are we co-creating with? And like I said, growing food and really doing the world in a different way. And so I've had the opportunity to meet with just the most brilliant people. So I would say that like for if you're stuck and if you're in fear and if you're with, withdrawn, find those people that are creating right now. Join those groups, like join those groups. And there's a lot of them. And really connect with your tribe and your people right now who are not going into fear and really are going into creation. Love it. I love it. Okay. Um, you two are so funny. You're like a step ahead with my questions kind of coming mm -hmm. right into the next one. And I, I'm going to challenge Lisa in a minute, but I'm going to skip over to Allison and say, you know, Lisa just said, well, if you're really stuck and, and we're speaking to our viewers right now, Hey, if you're really stuck, re remember to reach out to your community around you. Remember you're not you don't have to sit there alone. You can go find awesome people and create things together, right? So Allison, also, if you wanted to give our listeners a nudge for one easy entry point into the journey, what would it be today? Um, well, related to my work in, in helping people find play, I, I do this quiz, this play quiz, where I help them just decide their play personality to help them get unafraid. And very often when they find out, it's almost like, it's not to pigeonhole you into a certain identity, but it's to say, to remind you that there are different ways that you find joy and tap moments of freedom, lose track of time and get in flow and all those beautiful things where creativity is born. And so if that, if you uncover that you're an explorer and you haven't been to a new town in a while or visited a museum, or maybe you want to learn, learn a new language or an instrument, or maybe it inspires you to kind of get unstuck and realize that, you know, the, the life you're living, the treadmill you're on, the patterns you're in, you know, whatever you're not changing, you're choosing. And so when you choose to do something for you that suits this sort of play persona, or play activities or playful way of looking at the world with wonder and curiosity, um, that's what you're choosing. And so the idea that to empower people to, to get unstuck is really just helping, giving them the tools um, that maybe they're looking for and giving them also maybe the permission that they're seeking to just uh, go for it and, and sort of find more joy. Yes. Um... I got to get back to that one thing that you said about play. And I just want to hear how you move through this piece for yourself. If I am at a funeral and play, I'm going to be looked at sideways. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the times we, we are taught that you're supposed to act in a particular way in particular situations. But 
for me, I really believe that I can feel joy at a funeral. I can feel, have some fun, no matter what is happening. Like you just said, it is my choice with awareness. We do get the choice, Mm -hmm. but there's this thing that happens and it goes something like, oh my gosh, what will they think of me? Mm -hmm. And how do you move through that? It's a really great question. Um, I'm going to give you two sort of different but similar examples. First, I want to say grief is non-negotiable. It's a very singular process. I have had loss in my own life and I have been around people with deep loss. Two weeks ago, I was at my friend's son's funeral. 17 year old boy uh, died of a heart attack suddenly um, and he's gone. Um, I'm not talking about play instead of those things. Grief is a very real emotion and it needs to be processed. And I think what you find is that in the balance, when you kind of find your ground again, whenever that is for you, and for some cases it's years for people, um, it's saying that this life play is the great reminder of the one life you're living. You know, it can go at any point. We know that tomorrow you can wake up and it may be your last day and not to be grim, but death is one of the greatest teachers we have about, you know, this brevity of life. It's like, if we know laughter is one of the best medicines and life is short and, 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 and sink, you know, it's, one, it's our only life, then, then maybe play isn't so much frivolous as it is a great teacher. And the other example I'll give is um, having spent a lot of time in the Gaza Strip and, you know, the border of Afghanistan and in different places where conflict is real and um, in places in West Africa where poverty is real. I think that, and not that it's not here in this country, but just seeing it in the depths of, um, from a UNICEF perspective, I remember confronting somebody who had been working at UNICEF for years who said, in the midst of hunger and war, how can you talk about play? And I remember thinking, and particularly for children and young people, but also for the mothers and fathers who were raising them, um, that play is not only a means to an end to teach things for children like protection and and education and and, and all the things, HIV prevention, things we were doing, but it's actually an end in in a right in and of itself, that every child has the right to play. Every human has the right to play. Every person has the right to feel a sense of lightness and freedom, especially in the midst of conflict. strife and struggle. So it's it's not at the expense of those things. It's in addition to those things as a balance for it, going back to that word balance again. Um, I think, I hope that answers your question, but I think that that's, it's not to discount grief. It's to say that um, at the end of it, there's still life happening and you get one of them. Yeah. And that was definitely the example that you were talking about earlier that made me think of that because of the seriousness of the situation, right? And then feeling like you don't have permission, but Um, I love the way that you're talking about it. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, you are going to close out this party today. Tell us another way you love to empower people through those stuck points. Through the stuck points? Yeah. Um, I think by leading by example. (laughs) And, you know, people are inspired by what they see you do. And when they see you not, when when you give yourself permission to play, to be successful, to to be successful, that's a really good one. Um, A lot of women keep themselves stuck. I work with a lot of women. I do a lot of business coaching too. And I work with a lot of women who just, uh, you know, I think they're so incredible. And like, can't you see how incredible you are? And women have to work through all these layers. So when you give yourself permission, you know, when you give yourself permission to be successful, to, to be, to be happy, right. To attract, attract health, attract wealth, attract the life that you want to cultivate the life you want. It gives other people permission to cultivate the life that they want. Mm -hmm. So by when, you know, choosing your relationships carefully, being a good friend, you can't be, you know, so many places at one time, but being a really good friend and, and mom and spouse and, you know, everything else, all the other roles we sister, daughter, all the roles that we play committing to being good in those relationships um, and being, and giving yourself permission to be successful. I just see so many women holding back because 
because maybe they can't be more successful than a sibling or they can't be more successful than their friends or, um, but when you, when they see you being happy and giving back, you have the ability to give back tenfold when you are successful. And if you don't get to live in your joy, then you're living a life that is, is not, you're just not in your best spot, you know? So giving permission by living your best life, I think, um, and I take people on vision, you know, visual experiences of what would your life look like? And I take them with money. Like, what would your life look like with, you know, an extra thousand dollars a month, 2000, and we take it all the way up. And then we go through the second visualization of what you can't see along the way, just like this phone call, right? We couldn't expect that this was going to turn into such a beautiful conversation. I had no idea when I hopped on the call. But you're not going to know the people that you're going to meet along the way. And it's those little micro conversations that completely shift and change your life. And you're going to meet these beautiful people who are just going to fill you up. And you can talk about, yeah, I'm going to be able to pay my bills. And then they start to think bigger. And I'm going to take a vacation. And they start to think bigger. And then they start thinking legacy. But what you can't picture is all the little micro conversations that you're going to have along the way that's just going to completely shift your soul. And turn you into this amazing person that you can't even visualize. Thank you, Lisa. That's one of uh, the reminders to myself to just for inspiration and motivation. I talk to myself like that. Laura, the more successful you are, the more people feel the permission to go for it in their life, right? And so I love that one. That's one of my favorite, favorite ones. Um, Allison, Lisa, thank you so much for what you do in the world and for being here today to share it with everyone. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks for having us. I want everyone to remember that you can join us for the live stream book launch party on January 4th, 10 a.m. Eastern. We're going to gather with all of the Sacred Spaces authors, and we're going to be doing some fun giveaways that day. You're going to find that on the Brave Healer Productions Facebook page, and I have you linked up down below. And if... If one of these authors said something today that turned you on or sparked a little spark and you're curious, drop on down there because both of their websites are there linked up for you and click and explore and see what they're up to because they are up to some awesomeness. And they're very generously waiting for you to reach out and connect. Okay, so one more time, you are not alone, especially in these projects. One of the biggest missions was to have a book that by the time that you got to the end and you're kind of like thinking, well, now what? That there actually was a now what? Like you can connect with these people and you can take the conversation to the next level and you can ask for support and ask your questions. So go for it, you guys. Um, lastly today, everybody remember, your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it's time to be brave. See you next time, everyone. Bye, ladies.